Assistant Minister, Reverend Ann, and just for Reverend Ann speak, I notice a friend of mine who always seems to be here when Reverend Ann is speaking. <laughs> yeah, so that consciousness seems to bring all who needs to be here to hear this message, <laughs> Reverend Ann. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you. <laughs> it's just consciousness. It's not anything special. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to those joining us on the World Wide Web. My thoughts this morning are titled "Be God's." mental equivalent. One of our practitioners in the past week referred me to the Richer Living authored by Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker. The reading was from October 5, 2015. I quote from this reading, each of us has a definite and vital part to play in the whole life and love of this world. My present work environment and contacts are my opportunity to prove my spiritual worth. I rise in the dignity of my divine heritage and walk this world as a son or daughter of God. Today, I give love and creative thought to all I meet and to all with whom I associate. I'm a center through which God gives of himself to his universe, and I know this and appreciate this. I have faith in myself and in my fellow men. I express in unique ways the gift of life, the power of thought, and the holiness of love. I am important to God and necessary to man." End of quote. Let us look at this phrase, mental equivalent. What is a mental equivalent? Emmett Fox, in his wonderful little book, The Mental Equivalent, states, for anything that you want in your life, a healthy body, a satisfactory vocation, friends, opportunities, and above all, the understanding of God, you must furnish a mental equivalent. Form a mental equivalent of the thing you want by thinking about it a great deal, by thinking clearly and with interest. To think clearly and with feeling leads to demonstration, because then you have built a mental equivalent. Another writer states, some belief, thought pattern, idea is the mold for the desire expressed. Ernest Holmes and Kinnear in the New Design for Living states, one of the fundamental steps we need to take in creating a new design for living is the recognition that we are dealing with a power that makes things out of itself by becoming the thing it makes. So let us pause now and link the ideas together. Our present work, our vocation, environment, and contacts are the visible evidence of the desires that we have manifested in our life's experience. Through these areas of expression, we use as opportunities to express our spiritual worth as sons and daughters with a divine heritage. We have a definite and vital part to play in the life and love of the world as the only power and presence that created us out of itself gives by becoming the thing that it has created. So I've put all of that and summarized it for you. We are therefore Channels, malls, avenues through which the divine circuits of life, capital L-I-F-E, manifest a world that works for everyone. A world that works for everyone means that all must experience the attributes of our creator. Life, love, light, power, peace, beauty, and joy. Therefore, being a mental equivalent means that each one of us is responsible for, a me, for our mental thought patterns, which engender mental atmosphere, which facilitates 
the absorption and embodiment of God's perfect ideas that enhances our lives and blesses those who come into contact with us. That is our spiritual worth. We are not here to focus on making a lasting imp impression on our environment. That means setting up a statue down at crossroads. That's not what we are here for. We are here to express ourselves through our environment. There's a difference. We are here to express our innate divinity in our own individualistic, unique way because we are already spiritual beings. The only reason why there is restricted expressions in our life affairs, it's because we have not permitted ourselves to fully express that divinity. Our textbook states the only reason man is limited is that he has not allowed the divine within him to more completely express. In another essay, Dr. Holmes states, the infinite fills all moles and forever flows into new and greater ones. Within us is the unborn possibility of limitless experience. Ours is the privilege of giving birth to it." End of quote. Being God's mental equivalent must include a life more abundant. Always in sweet communion with our indwelling presence, whose law of good manifests what is good, beautiful, and true, all of good report in our lives. Our embodiment is directly proportional to what we truly believe and understand about our relationship with the cause of all life. Each one of us has individual talents, capacities, abilities, and therefore how we utilize them with the support of our mental atmosphere is the degree and extent we live a life of blessing to ourselves and others. Jesus the way sure in the parable of the talents gives us the ideas of what is expected of us in order to live a life or mental equivalent of enduring peace, joy, love, and happiness. This is taken from Matthew 25 verses 14 to 30. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into the far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straight we took his journey. Then he that hath received the five tal talents went and traded with the same, and made five other talents. And likewise he that received two, he also gained another two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with, him, with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast. That is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury, with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, 
and he shall have abundance. And from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. End of that reading. Irving Seal in his book, Learn to Live, suggests that simply use is the lesson behind this parable. Use de determines all qualities, good or bad. Don't use what you have, and it will rust away. Use it, and you increase it. Whether it is a muscle, an idea, or a tool, or money. But he has suggested a parallel higher meaning which increases our understanding of the rationale behind the science of thought and the way of spirit. Basically, also, an individual who fully utilizes his talents, abilities, and capacities with industry, ambitious, honest activity, no doubt, will achieve goals he has set out to accomplish in his lifetime. But his cues come from the external world, and therefore, he will have to take into consideration the offerings of the material world. But in looking at the higher meaning or metaphysical meaning behind this parable, the first idea is that the talent here is a measure of silver, which metaphysically means the life force or the awareness of life itself expressing through the individual. Therefore, this awareness of life can be measured in terms of spiritual gifts of life, love, truth, substance, intelligence, faith, power, judgment. In other words, the attributes of man's being which are established by the presence of God within. So there are those among us who with strong desires to succeed will no doubt evolve upwards on the spiral of life. And there are those of us who have to patiently commit to diligently working on oneself until success appears, even though the obstacles and challenges appear to somewhat limit us. But as I said previously, courage, strength, determination, we continue to work on our life purpose on this plane of existence. So therefore, with the understanding that we are looking at the use of our consciousness, our awareness of life in terms of the quantity of talents or gifts, many of us are like the five talent man. Five here is our five senses through which we glean our knowledge and information from the external world. The touch, the taste, the smell, the sight here. Here we judge sometimes by appearances which ultimately can fail us. But as spiritual thinkers, we know that the five outer are joined by our five internal senses. Hence, 10 talents. Five outside, five inside. The counterpart, your internal and eyes, ears, 10. As we develop our inner senses by remembering who we are, and constant, diligent, close communion with our indwelling spirit, we develop those senses. In other words, by drawing from that field of unbounded potentiality, then the determination of how our life reflects joy and unbounded happiness lies with the degree we develop our internal sense world. To quote Seal, the ideal man is one who has the inside and outside world well balanced. His inner sense of spiritual reality is great enough to modify and even transcend any discouraging circumstances in the physical world. This is what is meant by the doubling of the talents. It is actually a doubling of perception. We see the truth in all persons and all circumstances. This increases our faith and a consciousness of the goodness of life. We move from the limitation of viewing life from the external race consciousness to that what Trower describes as to open out into manifestation the wonderful possibilities hidden in the creative power of the universe. We are required to do two things. To see that we ourselves are necessary as centers for focusing that power, and at that time, withdraw the thought of ourselves contributing anything to its efficiency. It is not I that do the work, but the power 
that is within. All we are supposed to do is to know that we are centers of God consciousness and keep the channels open and clear so the divine circuits of life can specialize itself through us. The two talent person is similar to the individual mentioned above, the five talent person, which most of us are. But awareness and consciousness is at a different level. The five talent individual will commit to living the truth through diligent daily work of spiritual practices and trained, directed, focused thought to maintain consciousness at a higher level. The two talent individual desires to grow, achieve, create, and expand, but still allows the external to somewhat sway the diligent pursuit of establishing spiritual practicing, practices and focused thought to maintain consciousness. Spiritual growth is proportional to the degree of diligence to internal work. The one talent individual that bears the ability to think as well as let the external world determine his perception, allow this ability to lay dormant and inactive. There are no strong desires or instinct to change the circumstances of his environment, no matter how challenging they are. There is doubt, hesitation, even the desire to better one's life is attributed to God's will. Here is an individual endowed with the greatest treasure of life, individual thought, but is unable to recognize it by simply change your thinking, change your life. One can extend this ability to think to the awareness or consciousness of the presence of God within. Therefore, if one thinks of separation or cannot recognize that the consciousness of life indwells, then this state of mind separation produces challenges that will wear down faith confidence and initiative, which can only produce more of the challenges. Enter into the outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what happens. A mental equivalent of separation from the goodness of life can only breed challenges and more challenges. Therefore, our individual life purpose is through the perfecting of our experience is to radiate our divinity on this upward spiraling evolution towards completion in the whole. Therefore, the onus is truly upon us to diligently ensure that as we clarify our relationship with our parent, we express a greater degree of livingness and use of the creative power of the universe. My pronunciation of this lady's name is a little funny, but anyway. Tu Yu Yu, am I getting it correct? Is the first Chinese woman to win a Nobel Prize in the field of medicine for her work in helping to create an anti-malarial medicine. She's 84 years old, does not have a medical degree or a PhD. She was a researcher trained in pharmacology school, the Academy of Chinese Traditional Medicine. She was recruited to research the cure for malaria. When she started her search of this anti-malarial drug, 240,000 compounds around the world had already been tested, but to no success. That did not stop her. She continued her research until she was led to check ancient texts dating back 400 AD. She found the name of one substance, sweet wormwood, she was able to isolate an active compound, tested it, even upon herself. Success. This anonymous, modest woman received little recognition. It is now years later, she's now being honored for her contribution, along with two other researchers in the field of parasitology. Mother Teresa, who set up her mission, and I quote, our vocation is not the work. The fidelity to humble works is our means to put love in action. This crusader, when asked how she felt when people addressed her as a living saint, she replied in her own characteristic humble style, you have to be holy in your position as you are, and I have to be holy 
in the position that God has put me. So it is nothing extraordinary to be holy. Holiness is not the luxury of the few. Holiness is a simple duty for you and for me. End of quote. We have been created for that. The key words are humility, which means being teachable, faithful or fidelity, and holiness. Those are our attributes as well. So I can go back to the quote that was shared with me by the practitioner. My present work, environment, and contacts are my opportunity to prove my spiritual worth. These two humble women and countless others who have made up their minds to allow, to let what is within them to be expressed, to bless themselves and others, is the same thing that we are now called to do every day, no matter what you do. It is holy work. It blesses you and it blesses the entire world. You don't have to watch who is lauding you, just do what you have been given your talents and abilities to express on this life, on this um, earth plane. So nothing stopped those women from, or anyone who has put their minds to expressing themselves. So whatever it is, just allow ourselves to allow these extraordinary spiritual ideas that is in the unbounded to flow through us. The obstacles like government policy, sliding dollar, inflation, and a host of all thing, other things cannot stop the march forward to showcase new products, lives, industry, educational ex excellence, vocational satisfaction for the simple reason they are already effects and should not be used as cause to initiate manifestation. In our science of mind language, Secondary causation cannot be used to initiate a fresh sequence of cause and effect. Effects are already conditions and cannot form a platform for judgment or analysis. It is like applying the same effects to a problem and expect something new to result. Now that is insanity. Trod advises us, no, the only way to escape is by rising out of the region of secondary causes into that of primary causation where the originating energy is to be found before it has yet passed into manifestation as a condition. This region is to be found within ourselves in the region of pure ideas. What simply go within and let that originating creative principle express through us something new, something different, something extraordinary, a life of excellence. Form a new mental equivalent. Carlton Whitehead guides us through the process of letting go of old ideas. He states, the fulfillment of a new idea requires the mental and emotional release of the old, which is to be replaced. Infinite can give you only what you are prepared to receive. What you expect to receive is what you get. Right, so we have the list. When you have decided to move into a new experience and have given the idea to mind, ask yourself the following questions. One, which of my thoughts, feelings, and habit patterns are incompatible with the new idea and must be released. Second, if this were to happen within the next 24 hours, what would I want in readiness? Simple thing is that if you want to win the lottery, you have to buy a ticket. Right? What will living in this new experience be like? I'm going to repeat it. First, which of my thoughts, feelings, and habit patterns are incompatible with the new idea and must be released? If this were to happen within the next 24 hours, what would I want in readiness? And the third thing, what will living in the new experience be like? So let us think about these things when letting go of the old paradigms that no longer serve us. And we choose now to accept a new way of being. 
We then cooperate with that infinite mind within by acting as if the desired result is inevitable. Here we no longer pay lip service. We are ready to move forward into new adventures, new vistas of expression beyond faith, but with a knowing, with certainty and conviction and complete assurance. I repeat, within us is the unborn possibility of limitless experience. Ours is the privilege of giving birth to it. So we are going to practice now. For 30 seconds before I ask you to close your eyes, I want you to think of an idea or desire. You should have had it in the front of your mind already. You know? So this is just what you call um, revision. Think of this idea. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think of it. Think of it in fact that if in 24 hours you were to be given what you want, you know exactly what you want. Right? Think of it. And when it gets to the 30 second mark, you are going to close your eyes slowly and then live within that desire. Luxuriate in its accomplishment. Feel the feeling. Know what it is to live from that manifestation of that idea. Start now. Think of your idea. Close your eyes gently. Now live from that idea. See yourself in that desire expressed. Feel it from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Feel it in your heart, in your solar plexus. Feel it. Gently, coming back to this room, open your eyes. Within us is the unborn possibility of limitless experience. Ours is the privilege of giving birth to it. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend Ann. Will our ushers please come forward? Let us repeat the prayer on the envelopes. Lovingly I give, joyfully I receive. Feed our fruitful, increase and multiply. Bless, prosper, and enrich everyone whom you touch and replenish all of my financial affairs. Thank you, Father. And so it is. Our joy song today is I praise the wealth of God.